Uh, for some methods, such as parsimony, when we reconstruct phylogenetic trees, the uh, result we get out of it is sometimes a whole set of, uh, in the case of parsimony, equally parsimonious trees. Trees that we have uh, reason to believe all are fair, uh, give a fair representation of, of, uh, of the information that we have in our sequence data. So if, for instance, we, we do a parsimony analysis and get 200 equally parsimonious trees, uh, then uh, how should we interpret such a result? Well, the first thing that's important to realize is that the 200 or uh, so trees that we might get out of such an analysis, they will not be wildly different. They will be, on the whole, very similar. They will have very similar topologies where a lot of, of things are uncommon between them. And then there will be individual minor differences. One group moved from one place in the tree to a slightly different place. Uh, a few uh, clades maybe switch around, uh, but usually minor things. Nevertheless, we will often, uh, or in the case of some methods such as parsimony, get a larger number of, of trees. So the question is, how do we then most easily uh, summarize the information that's present in all of them? Because as I said, they will often agree on a lot of the information. And one approach for that, the approach that we use for parsimony and that we also use for some other methods such as Bayesian analysis, where as you'll see later in the course, the result is also a large number, maybe thousands of, of trees. The way that we summarize the things that are uncommon between such trees is via the method called consensus trees. So consensus trees can be constructed in different ways. One way called the strict consensus takes a set of input trees. On this slide, I've shown three input trees. The two first are the same. We have human together with chimp. Then more distantly, we have gorilla, orangutan, and gibbon. That's the, the, the way we, uh, we believe that tree should look. The second tree is identical to the first one. And then in the third input tree, in this case, chimp has moved over and is more closely related in, in that particular tree to gorilla than it is to human. So how would we summarize that information in a strict consensus tree? Well, the strict consensus tree, the idea is that it represents only the things that are in common between all the input trees. So what's in common? Well, one thing that's in common is that human, chimp, and gorilla together form a clade. They are a monophyletic group uh, where, where they are together. There's disagreement about whether chimp is closer to human or whether chimp is closer to gorilla. But all three trees agree that human, chimp, and gorilla form a group that's outside of orangutan and gibbon. So in the strict consensus, the result would be a polytomy, this situation where we have more than two branches emanating from an internal node, a polytomy including human, chimp, and gorilla, and then we would have orangutan and gibbon uh, in the same place as on the input trees. So this is a strict consensus. But of course you could argue that there's information we're not using in a strict consensus. Namely, the fact that two of the three input trees we have here in fact agree that chimp is more closely related to human than it is to gorilla. This can also be used in another form of consensus tree called the majority rule consensus tree. And it's really not a complicated idea. The, the idea is simply that the most frequently occurring groupings are the ones we represent in the consensus tree. So in this case, the first two trees agree that human and chimp are closely related. Only the third tree disagrees, but apart from that, it agrees on the other major features. The majority rule consensus tree would therefore be identical in this case to the first two. Okay, so the example I just showed you is a simple, small one where you could easily, just by uh, looking at it, find out what the consensus tree should be. But how about if trees go bigger, then obviously we need uh, more stringent ways. We need an algorithm. We need a recipe that a computer can use in order to find out from a set of input trees what is the consensus tree. And what is that algorithm? That's what I'm going to walk you through on the coming slides here. So imagine that uh, we have these five different uh, input trees. You can see that they all have the same taxa, A, B, C, D, E, and F. There's disagreement about the location of these. There are some things that are uncommon between these trees, and there are things that differ. 
So how would we construct a consensus tree from, from these input trees? Well, the main uh, insight is that what we're looking for is groupings. We're looking for, for groups of, of uh, leaves that go together. And the way that we do that conceptually in the case of consensus trees is that we focus on internal branches in the tree. Now, any internal branch in the tree, like the one I've indicated on the slide here, corresponds to what we call a bipartition of the leaves. If you cut an internal branch, like the one I've shown here, you will get a bunch of leaves that are on one side of that internal branch and a bunch of leaves, a subtree, that's on the other side of that branch. Okay? Right now we're focusing just on this particular branch. We don't care about branching order in the two separate subtrees that we would get out from, from cutting this particular branch. We only care about what leaves are on, what si on one side, what leaves are on the other side. So let's start in this example by looking at the first branch that I've indicated here. If we cut this branch, you can see that we would get A and E on one side and B, C, D and F on the other side. When we are trying to build a consensus tree, what we're doing is we're going through all of our input trees, one internal branch at a time, one by partition at a time, and then the idea is to keep track of which by partitions we see and how many times we see the different by partitions. So in the case that we're going looking at here right now, we have one by partition where we have A and E on one side, B, C, D and F on the other side. In phylogeny programs, you will often see by partitions symbolically represented in the form I've shown here with asterisks and, uh, and dashes. Uh, and uh, a good idea when, uh, if you want to try to do this yourself and you will have a handout exercise, in fact, after this uh, weekly quiz, sorry, after this uh, lecture, where you will try to do this yourself, a good idea is to write up by partition such that the smaller by partition is indicated by asterisks and the larger one by dashes. That way you can keep track of whether or not you've seen a given bipartition before more easily. Anyway, the first bipartition here, A and E on one side, B, C, D and F on the other side. And as I said, we're keeping track of how often we've seen different bipartitions. Right now we've seen this single bipartition once. But let's move on in that first input tree. The second branch here, if we cut that, you can see that we would now have a, C and E on one side, B, D and F on the other side. We would indicate that symbolically, as I've shown you in the table here, and we would add a count to indicate that we've seen this particular bipartition so far once. The third internal branch in our first input tree will give us B and D on one side and A, C, E and F on the other. We would indicate that in this way. Remember the smaller bipartition is shown by asterisks, it's, it makes it much easier to keep track of which ones we've seen. And again, we would put a count indicating we've seen this one once. So these are all the internal branches that are in tree number one. The rest of the branches are terminal, they're branches that lead to the leaves. They are not interesting because any tree, no matter how it looks, will of course have some branch going to one of the leaves. So those by partitions we don't care about, they will be present in all uh, possible trees. We're only looking at internal branches. Let's move to tree number two. First by partition, A and C on one side, B, D, E and F on the other. You can see we haven't seen this particular by partition before, so we add it to the table and keep track that of the fact that we've seen it once so far. Second by partition, A, C and E. We have actually seen this particular by partition before in the other tree. So we now increase the count of this particular bipartition by one. You'll notice that the branching order in the subtrees in this particular tree where we have A, C and E, we have A and C together and then E closer to the breakpoint. In the first tree we also had A, C and E together but with a different branching order. There A was next to E, here A is next to C. As I said, we don't care about that right now. Right now we're just focusing on this internal branch and the fact that there is a bipartition which will put A, E and C in a group that's separate from the rest. That's the same in these two trees. Moving on to the last bipartition, the last internal branch in this tree number two, we can see that we now have D and F. This is a bipartition we haven't seen before, so we add it to the table and put a count of one. 
tree number three, A and E. This is a bipartition we've seen before. We increase the count. Next bipartition, A, E, and F. We haven't seen that one before. Add it to the table. Third bipartition, B and C. We haven't seen that before, so we add that to the table. Again, we've now used all the internal branches. Fourth input tree, C and E. Haven't seen that before. Add it to the table. Next bipartition, A, C, and E. This is one we've seen before up here, so we increase the count, which is now at three. Third bipartition, D and F. Again, this is a bipartition that we've seen before, so we increase its count. Moving to the final input tree, A and E. We have seen that before, and we increase the count. Next bipartition, D and F. We have seen that before, and we increase the count. Third bipartition, B and C. We have seen that before, and we increase the count. So we now have a table listing all the different possible bipartitions that were present in all of our input trees, and we also have a count of how often we've seen them. So this is the information that we will use to build the consensus tree. This is the information from which we will summarize the information that was in common between all of these input trees. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we convert the counts to frequencies. Okay? We had some that we had seen three times, some that we had seen two times, some that we had seen once. Remember that we had originally five input trees. Okay? So when we observe something three times, the frequency is three divided by five, corresponding to 60%, etc. for the other counts. Step number two is now to take this table of bipartitions and sort it according to frequency, such that we get the highest frequencies on the top. Now, the idea in building a consensus tree is that we take everything, building a majority rule consensus tree, is that we take all the bipartitions that are present in more than half the trees and use those to build the tree. In this case, that's three of the bipartitions that we observed, which were present in 60% of the input trees, in three out of the five. So how do we build a consensus tree from these bipartitions? Well, one way to illustrate it uh, conceptually is to start out with what we call a star tree, which is a tree that has just all the leaves attached to a single node in the center there. We can then add one at a time the branches that correspond to these bipartitions. So let's try to see how that works. The first bipartition here, A and E together, separated from the rest. How would we make a branch that, that corresponded to that bipartition? Well, that's reasonably simple. We just add now a branch that puts A and E away from the rest of the leaves. If we cut this new branch we just inserted, then you can see that we'll have A and E on one side and C, D, uh, B, C, D, and F on the other side. So this branch corresponds to the bipartition, the first bipartition in our table. I've put the number 60 on this branch to indicate that we've seen it in 60% of the input trees. So let's move to the next bipartition. A, C, and E together. How would you add a branch to this tree to, to get those separated from the remaining leaves? Well, you would do it like this. We now have this second branch corresponding to the second bipartition. If we cut this, then we'll have A, C, and E on one side. We'll have D, B, and F on the other side. Again, I've added the number 60 to indicate that we've seen it in 60% of input trees. Third bipartition, D and F. How would you add a branch that separated those? You would do it like this. It's, of course, quite simple. This branch, cut it, D and F will go separate, the rest will be on the other side. And again, we put 60. So this is now the consensus tree. You'll notice that we had absolutely no problems taking these three different bipartitions and adding branches corresponding to them in the tree. The reason that that's possible is that since they're all present in more than half of the input trees, there will always be at least one tree where they are combined, where two of them, where each pair is combined. That means that they are compatible. So it is therefore always possible to build a tree from the branches that are present in more than 50% of the input trees. 
That's not the case for the branches that are present in less than 50% of the input trees. For instance, look at this one, B and C. Would it be possible to this tree now to add a branch that took B and C away from the rest? No, it wouldn't. There's no way you, that you can place a single branch here which would put B and C away from the rest of the tree. Same is true for the rest, B, what's the one, sorry, B and D. Again, there's no way you can put a branch in here that will take just B and D away from the rest. Same goes, if you look carefully, for the rest of these. So only the branches that are present in more than 50% were compatible with each other, and they are the ones that we've used to build this consensus tree. Occasionally, it will be possible to add some of the branches down here. Uh, in that case, some sort of software will uh, choose to do it, or you can ask it to do it. But the real, uh, the main thing in, in building a majority rule consensus tree is to use just the ones with more than 50% present. So this one, you can see that there's a simple recipe for building consensus trees from input trees. You can see that we can write a computer program that will do that, but what I now want you to do is to solve the first of the weekly quizzes where you get to manually do exactly this. This will give you some insight into how this works, and as soon as you've done that, please come back and continue with the distance matrix-based methods that we will talk about next.